So a diagnosis of cancer can hit you like a punch in the stomach. Other diseases may be just as life-changing, but somehow we know less about them. Yet cancer, we do know, means pain, grueling treatments, and potentially an early death. Now, many of us here in the audience will have had cancer or know somebody who has, and we're all too familiar with the statistics that say one, of one in two of us will expect to get cancer within our lifetime. Cancer, of course, can kill, but the mental stress that comes with a diagnosis can be as hard to bear as the illness itself. But I'm here to tell you a different story about cancer, a story about one woman who used her own experience and her love and appreciation of our, um, architecture to create a new kind of cancer care, the kind of cancer care that gives people hope and fundamentally makes people not lose the joy of living in the fear of dying. This is Maggie Keswick Jenks. Uh, Maggie was a landscape architect and designer. She was married to Charles Jenks, architectural critic, and mother to Johnny and Lily. Maggie was 40 when she was first diagnosed with cancer. Five years later, her cancer returned, and she remembered the moment when she was with her doctor and she heard the seriousness of what she faced. She remembers being in an awful interior space with bright neon lights and plastic chairs. And when the nurse called them in, she immediately said to the doctor, how long have we got? She specifically remembers speaking in the plural, because when you get cancer, it doesn't just affect you, it affects your whole family. How long have we got? And the doctor said, do you really want to know? And they said, yes. And he said, three to four months. And they said, oh. Then the doctor filled the silence with sympathetic suggestions of not running around the world looking for cures, but to enjoy the time they had left. And then the nurse said, I'm very sorry, dear, but we have so many people waiting. Would you mind going into the corridor? So Charles and Maggie sat in a windowless corridor dealing with the business of having a few months to live. And at that point, Maggie thought, I'm really sure the doctor would want to spend more time with me. But quite genuinely, there were so many people waiting. She was also pretty sure that he wanted to send her somewhere far superior than the corridor to go and contemplate the enormity of what they just discussed. But there was nowhere else. Michael Lerner, who wrote Choices in Healing, likens cancer to a parachute jump, landing behind enemy lines, surrounded by thick fog. Where is the enemy? What is the enemy? Who is the enemy? Which way is home? No map, no road, no compass. Lerner suggests that doctors are pretty good at handing out the parachutes, but not necessarily the maps. And in the meantime, you're in the war zone. Which way is home? You're trying to learn a new language. You're trying to reprogram your pain threshold. How much can you actually bear? Exhaustingly, all of this is being learned at the same time. Charles remembers when Maggie got home after hearing the news. She went to bed and started to die. She got thinner, smaller less mobile. And after what Charles describes of about two weeks of inward shrinkage, something spontaneously happened to both of them, like they made a pact or a decision. If we're going to go down, let's go down fighting. And so they used their contacts around the globe to look for information and option. And as that information and options flowed in, she got or mesmerized by all of the information that was coming to her. Her energy came back, her color came back, her fighting spirit came back. She was beginning to make her map. Maggie used everyone around her to help her build her map, know, build her knowledge and, and skills, including her doctor and nurse, Laura Lee and Professor Bob Leonard. But as we've heard tonight, Maggie experienced the isolation of a cancer diagnosis, the awkwardness of people not knowing what to say to you. Maggie also experienced the isolation and the paralysis that comes 
when you see the suffering of your husband and children. Maggie remembered that her shattered mind vibrated so loudly in her head, she thought she might disintegrate. Maggie found yoga to help her re-establish some calm. She found counselling to help her think more rationally and calmly about her children's future. She got interested in nutrition, the properties of certain foods, perhaps not so important as the actual properties of the food, but the fact she was back in control of that element of her life. She was beginning to find the joy of living, despite her fear of dying. And at that point, she had an idea of how things could be improved for people like her and families like hers. Now, despite the, ca the chaos of her cancer diagnosis, Maggie noticed everything. The small things, uh, the good, the bad, and how it made her feel. She noticed the bright neon lights. She noticed the plastic chairs, the plastic cups from the vending machines. She noticed the fact that, well, the colors, lack of colors, so much white magnolia everywhere. She noticed when people were very good at making eye contact with her. She noticed when people were good at introducing themselves and welcoming her and her family onto a ward or a new department. She noticed when people didn't get it quite right, and she noticed when people got it exactly right. She noticed when very busy people made her feel like they had all the time in the world. She noticed how illness can shrink you. She was an educated woman, and yet in front of the doctor, she could often not remember what to say. And, and if, if somebody said, suggested something, she didn't know how to challenge it. I mean, how does that happen? I'm sure we can all think of moments when we've gone to see the doctor, we've got our list of questions, and actually we're not brave enough to ask them. Now, I, I could stand here for some time with this slide, because I do believe small things matter. And like Maggie, if we get the small things right, we get the big things right. And if we get the small things right, actually our work and our lives become much, much better. Now, this is what Maggie could see from her inpatient bed. And as a designer and her husband as an architect, they saw the potential in this little stable block. Um, Maggie imagined a space where um, dedicated to people with cancer. She imagined um, an uplifting space where you could go and talk about all of the things that you weren't brave enough to talk to your nurse or doctor about. She imagined a space where you could go and ask for your questions to be repeated over and over, because we know that when people do mention the word cancer, not only do we lose our ability to speak, but it's often not easy to remember. This is the first Maggie Centre, Maggie's in Edinburgh. This was that sad stable block um, that we saw on the, on the last slide. This opened a year after Maggie died. Um, her husband Charles, her nurse Laura, and her doctor Professor Leonard made her vision a reality. This is a space where families can go and get all of their questions answered. A place where people can go and learn new skills and new coping mechanisms. The heart of a Maggie Centre is the kitchen, and most importantly, the kitchen table. It's a place where people can congregate to chat or sit silently. It's a place for the whole family to go, knowing the pain and suffering she saw in her mother, husband, and children. These are some other Maggie centers. This is Maggie's in Dundee. This is Maggie's in London. And here, our Maggie center in Swansea. Now, all of these centers are built on busy, acute hospital sites, believe it or not. Maggie and Charles were personal friends of great architects like Frank Geary, Lord Richard Rogers, all of whom have gone on to develop and build Maggie centers for us. And they taught us that physical space can have a profound effect on the way we feel. Now, Maggie's architectural brief is a demanding one. We say to our architects, of course, we want the building to function. We want to be able to run our program. 
We want people to be able to do group activities, um, individual activity, we want people to be able to bring their family, and we want the space to work for us. But most of all, we want the space to make you feel valued. We want the space to embrace you. We want the space to make you feel safe. When you're frightened, we want the space to make you feel less anxious. Let me tell you about Jean. Jean is a 70-year-old woman, and her daughter, who's 41, has incurable cancer. And Jean came to visit Maggie's in Swansea here. She didn't know much about Maggie's, she didn't know what to expect, but she had heard a lot about it from her daughter. So when she walked in the door, she had no idea what was going to happen to her, and she was overwhelmed with the response before she'd even had chance to engage in conversation. The space literally unbuttoned her emotions. All of the emotions that she'd held so tightly for so long, not knowing who, how, or where to express them. Within minutes, she felt safe enough to let them out. And when she left, she could breathe a little easier. Making buildings that enable people to breathe a little easier is literally part of our brief. And we believe that clever and thoughtful architecture is extremely powerful. It enables, it inspires, and it brings a sense of humor to even the darkest of moments. But it isn't just the architecture that makes Maggie successful. It's our program of support, it's our staff within the center. At Maggie's, we listen, we educate, we inform, we embrace, we connect, we make people smile. We specifically make people feel less lonely, and we've heard a lot about that tonight. And we exist to make the unbearableness of cancer more bearable. We educate and inform through our courses and workshops. There's Tai Chi and yoga, stress management. There are courses for carers. There are nutritional workshops, knowing how much value Maggie had got from that. And we listen. There's been many a wonderful TED talk done on the art and the power of listening. Really being engaged, not distracted, properly listening. Maggie thought her nursing and medical care was excellent, but she thought her nurse and doctors didn't always have the time. At Maggie's, we give people that time. We also rebalance that imbalance of power between caregiver and care receiver, thinking about how Maggie felt when she was in front of her doctor. We start a conversation with people over a kettle, across the kitchen table. There's an informality to that relationship that balances out that power between caregiver and care receiver and makes it an exchange of equals. Maggie's, in every Maggie Center, there are a team of professional people, but there are no white coats. Now, when Maggie's in Edinburgh opened some 22 years ago, it was only going to be one center. But actually, the network has grown, and um, we now have 22 Maggie centers, 20 in the UK, two abroad, one in Hong Kong and one in Japan. And despite the fact we're purely funded on voluntary contributions, Maggie's vision is slowly becoming a global movement. We have 10 more centers planned in the UK, and we're working with teams in Barcelona, Norway, and Netherlands. Actually, it seems to us that it doesn't matter about culture, geography, age. Actually, what we want when we're di diagnosed with cancer is a place to go that feels safe, where we can go and feel listened to, where we can connect with other people. And before I finish, let me tell you a little story about Mr. Kitagawa. So, Mr. Kitagawa uses our Maggie Center in Tokyo. And he was diagnosed with a stage four stomach cancer, and his consultation with the doctor went remarkably similar to that of Maggie's. 
When they spoke, the doctor very sympathetically told him he had just a few months to live and he should make the most of the time he had left. This paralyzed him, not just because he had a couple of months to live, but he had no idea how to make the best of it. Mr. Kitagawa couldn't eat, he was hospitalized, and after about two weeks, his brother suggested that he visits Maggie's in Tokyo. Not knowing what to expect, he went along. He sat round the kitchen table with Masako and the team and started talking. And having been there about an hour, he reached into the middle of the table, picked up a cake and started eating it. And his brother said, oh my God, you, you're eating, you're eating it. How come you're eating it? And he said, I've just realized the pain in my stomach was anxiety. And being here, that anxiety is passing. I now know how to make the best of the time I have left. The night before Maggie died, she sat in the garden with her husband Charles, surrounded by the ideas and all of the information she had captured throughout her own experience. A book that had become a view from the front line, that's the blueprint for all of our Maggie centers. She sat with Charles and she looked up to the sky and said, and meant it, aren't we lucky? Well, some two decades later, with 22 Maggie centers and many more planned, and having supported hundreds and thousands of families to make the unbearableness of cancer more bearable, it's us who feel lucky. So thank you, Maggie, and thank you for listening. <laughs>